Good morning, everyone. We are here today for a really quick version of telling the full story about using use cases and user stories. My name is Lauren Kelly. I'm a senior engagement manager at Pantheon Systems. Uh, I lead the Pantheon Migrations team. Uh, this is actually more drawn from my experience as a developer than it is from my experience currently at Pantheon. So a lot of this is more of uh, information that was drawn from my past than what I'm currently doing. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. This is usually a much longer uh, deck. I've trimmed it down, but covering a couple things. One is a quick introduction to user stories, uh, a quick introduction to use cases, bringing it all together, and then I really prefer to have a kind of discussion about what people are using, what's working for them, and things like that. So if we can end with that, that would be amazing. So first up, user stories. So I think we're all very familiar with user stories. As a user role, I want to do something so that some value is achieved. So for our example here, we've got as a content editor, I want to associate images with events so that the correct image is used for an event, right? So they're not mismatched. Really, that seems like really basic and easy. The question is, is that something you could actually deliver with confidence? Does it have enough information? Is everything there that you would actually need to do to put that in place for, for your project? So there's certain benefits to user stories. One of them is planning. Um, the work within the user story can be estimated, reliably used for sprint planning, right? So if we go back to this example here, where we're talking about a content editor, we can say, okay, we could def this doesn't really have the scope defined. This is actually a really weak example with just these three pieces here. But we could refine this, we could scope it, we could work with this and get a good estimate and put it in a sprint and know that that work was going to be done. It is also makes it really easy to collect information from non-technical stakeholders because it's kind of written in plain English, right? You can it's, it's a little awkward, it's stilted, but it's very it's like just how you would normally say, hey, I want this, I I want to be able to do this. Okay, why do you want to be able to do this? Well, because uh, you know, and you get that information, right? Uh, it also allows the team who's working on the stories to stay focused. When you've got a task in front of you, a user story in front of you, you know this is what you need to work on, this needs to be completed, and you can do it. However, there's also limitations to using user stories. They're really only meant to be used for sprint development. They're meant to be developed for that specific task of, es of estimating work for a sprint, putting it in there, and moved through the stages of the sprint, and then discarded. They're not meant to be a permanent resource for the project documentation. Uh, the other limitation, which I kind of hinted at before, is that if the, the team is inconsistent in meeting requirements for the user stories, they allow for scope creep. So in that example that we had about the content manager, you know, working with the images and things, it doesn't define, like, what content types are we talking about of, you know, are there multiple event types, are there multiple image types, is it a specific field, anything like that. Are they being, are they being tagged, or how are they being, you know, there's no scope in there or anything like that. That could grow into a huge story, or it could just be a really basic one. And you don't really know, the, you can't really deliver that one with confidence. And my biggest complaint about using user stories, and this is one that I saw all the time when I was working in agencies, was that they're very narrow-sighted. It's extremely easy to slip into using user stories as a checklist to be completed. And you know, when you deliver this, without ever looking at the big picture, there were multiple projects I was on that I would be running through. I'd be kind of in hair projects, and I think we've all done that, and it's always been interesting. Um, you would see the stories listed in the done column of whichever you know management system you're using and you'd look at this the go into the site and look at it and work on it and you'd see that it was completely unusable by the end user like there it was too complicated they had to go through 14 steps to do something that was incredibly basic all these issues because nobody looked at the big picture and they were just delivering by checklists of user stories so that's how you create a monster site in my mind. If you're building piece by piece without looking at the system as a whole, you get all these pieces added on. Somebody comes in and they say, hey, I want this functionality, I want this functionality. And it's added on without any thought about how it affects the rest of the site, how it affects the users using the site, and all of these things like that. 
So that's where we bring in use cases. So if we back up a little bit, if you consider each project a novel, <laughs> um, or a movie, or a story, you know, if you consider it as a whole entire thing, imagine if you didn't know all the characters and their storylines. If you had to rewrite an entire section of a website, which is what we're asking developers to do if they don't have the big picture, every time you introduce a new character in there, every time you come in and you know, uh, Frodo walks in and out of a scene or anything like that, or Gandalf is here or there, you, every time they have a new interaction, if you didn't know that that was coming up in the future, you'd have to rewrite everything to make that work. We want to avoid that. So use cases provide the storyline. They tell you who will be doing what and when and where they'll be doing those things in the, in the big picture. So a use case consists of multiple pieces of documentation. There's a diagram that displays all the interactions between the actors and the systems. Um, so part of what I cut out of this to keep it a little bit shorter is the discussion about personas. Um, if you consider, um, when you're doing a project, if you create a persona as your actor who's doing things, it's like creating a Dungeons and Dragons character for your projects. That's the fun part for me. Um, <laughs> But then you're basically saying, okay, what is this character going to be doing? What is this actor going to be doing? And we create diagrams that say everything that the, the actor is going to be doing. And then you create a list for each of those actions, for each of those interactions. You create a list that has the step-by-step -step list uh, of all the steps, step-by-step -step of all the steps. There are alternative steps, like what, you want, what path you want them to follow, what alternative paths there are, what options you want them to have. And you have to also consider the things that you, they might mistakenly do. So if you have a user filling out a form and they hit the back button instead of the continue button, what's going to happen? Is that data going to be lost? Is it going to be stored? How is that going to be handled? And then finally, you also have a document that contains information about the primary actor, the goal, the preconditions, the post conditions, and definition of success. So it's a big piece of, it's a lot of work. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you. Doing these is a lot of work. If you do it up front, it is worth it. So that's my, that's my argument here, at least. So this here would be the diagram of all the different interactions that all of the actors would have. Right? We have a site visitor, and we're going to look at their registering for an event. So here's a sample steps of a site visitor registers for an event. Here's the steps we want them to follow. You would also, again, have like uh, an alternative path here, where if um, we have in step seven here that they uh, complete the login. Well, if they needed to do another step of uh, verifying their, uh, oh, we have to verify their contact information because they're already an existing user, they're logging in. If instead they were a new user, so a new user registration would be an alternative path on this. And then finally we have this piece, which is uh, one of my favorite pieces of the, of the documentation for, for these. You have the summary of the actor. Who, who were we talking about? What are they going to be doing? What's their goal? What's success mean? What are the preconditions? What assumptions are we making? And what are we, how do we know when it's done? What's success look like? Now, in none of this are we defining how solutions will be implemented. This is purely about the problem to solve, our, you know, what steps, you know, what it looks like when it's solved and what it looks like, at, you know, before and after, basically. We're not talking about what the actual solution is here. So the downsides of use cases. Um, we've all had projects closed that everybody's really excited about. The dev team wants to jump in. They're ready to go. They have this great idea how to implement this solution. They have to slow down. You have to stop at that point, gather the information, write all the stories. You have to work with your teams and talk about what do the stories mean? How do we define these? What does this look like as the big picture? It's time consuming. Um, and typically one person can't do it. You do have to delegate, you have to work with your teams, and you do have a, you need a system to keep all this organized. However, when you bring it all together, once you build this all out, you have the ability to then write user stories that answer all of those steps, all of those stages, all those questions of how. You have a user story that will resolve that. You can implement that into your sprints and know that things are going to actually 
uh, you have fewer blockers because you know that you have that big picture of the whole story. You're not wondering what's going to happen if we make a change. How is this going to affect other things? Things aren't going to, you know, you're going into a sprint knowing what the blockers are instead of finding it out halfway through the sprint. The scope of the project has been thoroughly defined. Um, you can easily at that point say, hey, what functionality, if we're, we're over budget, you know, we're, we're already used up all our hours, what functionality can we like trim out? What's the, how can we prioritize this? And it's really easy, again, like when you have uh, the examples of something like this, to go to the stakeholders and say, how critical is this piece? How badly do we need this? And obviously this one would be important. But how badly do we need this? Can we lower this in priority and put it in, in another round of development? And they can see then how it fits in that big picture too. We also have this glorious thing that I love too. Um, if you go back to this one, this can be turned into your BHAT testing basically to basically, you just turn this right into, and even if you're not using automated testing, if you needed to turn this over to your QA team, You've got this all available right there to them. They know exactly how things should be working. And they also, if you've done all the documentation that goes with this of the alternative workflows and the mistakes and everything, they can follow all of those paths and see and make sure that everything is taken care of. And then, obviously, you have this entire document that you can share with stakeholders. You could hand this off to another team. If you brought in a new developer, if you brought in a new project manager, if you brought in anybody new to the project, if a stakeholder left and came, a new one came in, you could have all of this documentation in there without questions about, um, you know, what's priority, what's this, who's this, who's requesting this, why is this in here. It's all in your documentation. Uh, the Biggest thing, which I mentioned, is this is time consuming. At some point, you have to stop documenting and you do have to start doing. So this is, even though this is obviously supporting an agile process, this in itself is an agile process. If something is missing, you need to add it in. But now you can add it in without wondering how it's gonna affect other pieces. You can check to make sure that it isn't affecting anything else. Or if it is, you know it in advance. You can update each of the other affected areas quickly and easily so that your documentation is up to date. And you can adjust upcoming sprints with new user stories. That's the best way to keep being awesome and tell the whole story. And then I just have a couple quotes because the, this is actually the stopping the documentation is one of the biggest things for me. I always have this sense of once I start documenting a project, I actually want to have everything documented. But honestly, We've got here, the pursuit of perfection often impedes improvement. You have to get started to know what needs to improve and what needs to change. And if I waited, with, if I waited for perfection, I would never write a word. And that's exactly the point, too. You can't have everything perfect. It has to be a living document. The, uh, or the whole plan has to be a living plan. You need to be updating. You need to be revisiting it. It's not a one-time look at it, complete this, chuck it out the window. It's, uh, it's a piece of the project, and it needs to be treated that way. And then I have got some resources here, um, primarily on creating use cases. I mentioned personas. There's a link there on personas. Uh, Gather Space has some excellent documentation on use case examples. And honestly, the Wikipedia link is, uh, is fantastic as well. I was impressed by that. And there's a book that I've always enjoyed. It's by Alistair Cockburn. It's not, I don't know if there's a more recent edition than this one, but uh, it is a, is a great book for learning how to implement this into your process. So is anybody here currently using use cases in their projects? Have you found it helps? Does it make a big difference? Like, do you find like it's easier to write user stories and things like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, but I do find that it, it's time consuming, basically. Um, and I'm a team of three people. So I'm the project manager and I've got like two developers. So it kind of lands on my shoulders to, to do all these cases. And really, they, they, we just want to get started on doing the project. Yeah, and, um, in case you couldn't hear that, that's uh, just basically what I was saying is time consuming and that developers really just want to get going when something comes through, especially when they've been consulted on it before it closes, which is ideal. Um, yeah. Do you see 
I think we can. Uh, can we use the mic for that, just to make sure that there it's part of the recording and everything? Is that possible? Can you come up to the mic? I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I was wondering because always when I beg to the use case and try, we need to research before we start working. I always say that the hours you put in in front, you will subtract in fixing stuff or doing stuff again in the in, when you're coding. It, right. Exactly. With you. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And that's why um, you're not only saving it on coding, but you're also saving time on when you hand something off to the stakeholders, it's what they were expecting and it works the way they expected rather than it being like you hand it, you deliver this thing that you've worked on for hours and you know, your whole team has been on for a, you know, a month or two or three or six and you hand it off to the stakeholder. Thank you. And you know, they're shocked and surprised and this is not at all what they were looking for. Uh, we want to avoid that as much as we possibly can. Yeah, can you, do you mind coming up? talk very loud. <laughs> so, but from your experience, um, is there a way you can use a template? Because I can imagine like some of the processes are very similar in various projects. Um, how does it work out for you? I definitely use templates, definitely. Um, so if the, sorry, my uh, musical rock up here. Um, obviously these are, you can't really, template this part. I mean, you could copy and paste this for anything, like different stages of it, of each piece of the project, you could copy and paste this if you've got the same actors and just change what they're doing. But, um, and, and this is already basically a template. Like I, the, the full version of this has a couple other steps in it, right? It has the, the steps defined, the alternative steps, the, um, you know, what you don't want them to do and, and identifying those issues and things. Um, and this though is definitely templated and oh, this is what I, this is the structure I always use and always fill out as, you know, defining that. And um, yeah, I pretty much just copy and paste. Like once I start on a, on a piece and I'm defining these, I just kind of copy them and then just edit them for each little piece that I'm talking about. And mass produce and then edit. <laughs> Um, I really do try to encourage my teams, like I, you have to delegate this out. So if you know that this is a piece that someone else is, the, you know, if you have a developer who's going to be working on this piece, um, if you can't sit down with them to work on it together, which is ideal, but if you can't, then have them at least, get, you know, do it and then you can review it and, and move forward. It's horrible for developers, and I'm so sorry for suggesting that they do it, but it, they are qualified to be able to, you know, go in and say, this is what I'm envisioning. When we're talking about this piece, this is what I'm envisioning. And then you know ahead of time, too, this doesn't match up with what the big project is. But somebody does need to own it and make sure that it's all cohesive. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question. In, in the Agile process, you do backlog ref refinement, you get epics, you get use stories, and you go into more detail. Where does this relate to the moment when you start writing this? Because I see you uh, writing use, use cases and then adding user stories. Right, exactly. So this is before you start doing the user stories. And then if something needs to be refined, because you, you mentioned... Um, you know, you start the, the user stories and then you refine, there's a refining process as you go through. When you're doing, if you have this done in advance, you can then refine without worrying about how it's going to affect the other pieces. Um, you know in advance if that's going to cause a conflict later on or with other work that's being done in that sprint especially. Do you still use the, use, uh, the user stories to define the sprint? and? The yeah, exactly. You do this. Then you do the user stories, estimate the user stories, and then work with the implementation that way and follow your normal workflows. So this is just kind of all ahead of that to make sure that your user stories are all together. Okay, I think we are just about out of time. Is that, uh, do you need to set up for? One more question. One more question, okay. Anybody? Yeah. How does this fit into not like the application design and solution design? because some of those use cases to use stories might rely on the actual solution, right? Um, as far as, can you? 
how are these things are going to be done when you're thinking about so when, when do you how do you knit in a solution design and how the application is actually going to behave as working with software right so if you have the story the big story defined then you can break down into these little pieces especially with the preconditions and the post conditions um, and then from there the user stories are going to talk more about the uh, when you're doing the, again the refining of the user stories you have the user story of this user wants to do this well, how are we going to talk about that? And that's when you talk about the solution. And you have, again, you have the big picture as a reference. So you have um, all of this in your mind as you're doing that. So you could say, okay, what actually will handle all of this together? Since all these pieces are interrelated for this functionality, how do we consider all of that together and come up with a solution instead of looking at just the one piece and doing a solution? Okay, thank you. for contribution tomorrow um not tomorrow thursday there we go <laughs> thank you so much